So I want to thank the organizers again. This has been a spectacular opportunity for me to learn from such a great diversity of leaders. I hope that uh, I give you a slightly different view because I'm going to start at a much, much finer scale than I think what you've heard, uh, at least in terms of imaging. So as Alan said, I direct the National Center for Microscopy. And we like to work in what I call the mesoscale, which is not down here to the level of whole brain imaging uh, from alive people. This is my wife. I assure you she's still alive. But from about the level of a cell, this neuron in this instance, this glial cell here, an astrocyte, down to the level of supramolecular structure and try and bridge this domain and put it in the context of atlases like the Allen uh, organization has put together. And I thought for this uh, particular talk, what I'd try and do is pick out a few places where I think there are significant gaps, where we have problems bridging scales, and where I think there's some substantive questions in neuroscience. And just as a way, again, of self-introduction, uh, the National Center for Microscopy has been in existence now for 22 years. It's one of the biotechnology centers that NIH supports. And we've divided our activities very much like the Allen Institute uh, into three compartments. Chemistry, and I got this idea actually from John Sadat, who in a meeting once said it's all either chemistry, instruments, or algorithms. And so part of what we do is we make markers, particularly for correlated light in EM, to mark or introduce specific reporters. And I have the benefit of uh, being a close colleague uh, of Roger Chen for 22 years, so we have a lot of uh, uh, great activities there. And then building instruments, because I'm a tinkerer and I've attracted tinkerers, we get large amounts of money and there's something on the order of 50, 60 million dollars worth of hardware on the floor for doing things that are a little bit beyond what you might find in a typical laboratory. And then I've recruited a lot of mathematicians who work with us to develop technologies to improve the quality of those images, again, in very large scale. And more recently, uh, again, with the benefit of philanthropic funding from Ted Wade in this instance, the co-founder of Gateway, we developed something called the Whole Brain Catalog, which you can think of as a viewing environment for data that comes from everybody. That's the intent. So again, to the business of spanning scales, this is a slide that shows some of the more classic methods and what their range is within the link scale. And so light microscopy, as you'll hear or have heard or know, is being extended in both directions. And of course, with the slide scanning technologies that you're using, you go out to centimeters at this point. There's a technology I'll show you a bit about, serial block face SEM, or dinkatomology, which has the capability of going across uh, a broad range as well. Electron tomography, where I've spent 20 years pushing the, the envelope, so to speak, has also a broad range if used in interesting ways with very large microscopes. So because we field these instruments and the software, we go from an instrument like a light microscope, a high throughput laser scanning two photon microscope or an electron microscope to build cells of their parts and put them in this context. So we build the workflows, et cetera. That led us to this kind of a project, which you can think of uh, with the metaphor of uh, Google Earth or Bing Maps as a worldview of the brain. This is, of course, the Allen Brain Atlas. And the way that, for example, in Google Earth that you find uh, details of your street is they've used specialized devices to get the street views, and those are knit into this spatial framework. And then from anywhere in that environment, in a modern information age, you can go to Wikipedia and look up information that's spatially linked. Well, in brain research, we're doing the same sort of thing. The instruments at the National Center for Microscopy and elsewhere are used to, allow, uh, to obtain data. Those data can be linked into this construction project. Here are some of the kinds of images. And then we have a Wikipedia-like environment called Neurolex. It's part of the neuroscience information framework where you can go by space, by location, or by semantic links to information that's being accrued from about 300 different data resources. So now to the task at hand for the, the meeting. What are the open questions? What's missing? So I'll focus today on really three areas, but into two clusters. Uh, you're not meant to read all of this. 
But the open questions about what's missing, I think the most interesting one is what about the glia, which you've heard almost nothing about so far. So we were fortunate, uh, more or less by accident, in that we observed that astrocytes actually don't overlap. They have domains, territories. So I'll describe a little bit of that and what I think the next questions are. And what does that mean in terms of function, in terms of areas of the hippocampus, clusters of neurons, how they'd influence areas in the amygdala, as we heard. And then diving down a little bit in terms of uh, uh, intracellular systems, can we make molecular maps of whole cells and link them into brain atlases? And what might we learn from that? Well, remember that neurons in our brains are there pretty much, except for a few that arise during life, for the life of the organism. And they have a huge housekeeping problem. Just to deal with the detritus of the life of a neuron, where to put it, how to get rid of it, etc. So I'll show you a couple of examples, or at least one in the time that I have, of why it's important to study intracellular systems in a neuron, just to look at the protein degradation pathways. And then something that I've had in the back of my mind, been not brave enough to pursue for 25 years, is what about the nucleus and its organization? How does it relate to the cytoskeleton? How would we get to a level of uh, imaging where we could determine whether there is a mapping in one of these cells that's uh, terminally differentiated, sort of there for the life of the organism? So for the astrocyte. This is uh, from a journal I like to think of more as the National Enquirer of Science. Okay, it's uh, an article by a former student of mine, Doug Fields, and it's asking, have we missed half the brain? Well, actually, more than half the brain, because I think in human, there are 1.7 astrocytes per neuron, at least in the cortex, that's the, the number. And I think we heard earlier about outliers. Einstein apparently had more of them. This is uh, Marion Diamond published a nice paper looking at his brain. So maybe astrocytes are important for some functions. But is this what it really looks like? Well, I think not. And it doesn't look like this. This is the old model, 1893. Although they probably had some of the functions, right? They certainly interact with vessels. They're uh, probably, yes, certainly housekeeping cells, among other things. Uh, but they're increasingly seen as collaborating with neurons, probably modulating neuronal activity in interesting ways. But this is not at all what they look like. Uh, Eric Bouchong in the lab, and uh, Benji Smarr, who's out here somewhere, succeeded in uh, doing something interesting, looking at what was either, this is a gliofibrillary acidic protein stained uh, astrocyte, you could get the same sort of view by silver staining, same magnification, this is what happens if you fill the cell with, a, with lucifer in this case, just with a microelectrode. You take a dead piece of brain, fresh, so that the gap junctions are closed, you fill the cell, and you look at it with a high resolution capability and light microscopy, and you see it looks different. If you counterstain with glial fibrillary acidic protein, this is what you see. I'm colorblind, so I think that's green, right? So the news is that 85% of the cell was missed for about 100 years or more. And it's as if what you knew about this cell type was is if you went to Yellowstone after the fire and the trees that you understood to be trees were the burned out hulks of the trees, the trunks. Okay. So this is kind of important. And the next question that we asked was, do their domains uh, really overlap? People had thought that just like pine trees in the forest, the limbs of the astrocyte interfaced with one another, crossed one another. So we asked, because we could fill them with multiple colors, if that was true. The answer is no. Certainly not in gray matter. They form territories. These are four different astrocytes. This is just with a little computer trick to look at where the interface is. It looks like the coast of England, but it's discrete. So each astrocyte has a territory. Okay, so we put forward a new concept. When we first did this uh, a little less than a decade ago, everybody said, oh, well, first it's not true. Then they said, we've all seen it before. What's interesting is that is true for the shrub portion of the astrocyte. I used to call it the bush, but I lost that word from my vocabulary. Um, there's a process that the astrocytes extend that goes to vessels. 
and they'll cut across the domain of other astrocytes. And so astrocytes, just like neurons, have different parts that probably have significantly different functions. We know there are specific proteins out here where the vessel would run, aquaporin-4, calcium-activated potassium channels, and the like. So this gets interesting. So here, Yuri, this is just hippocampus for you. This is the old model. This is the new model, so we get to rewrite the textbooks a little bit. This is the parcellation, if you like. But in uh, protoplasmic astrocytes in the hippocampus, each astrocyte is about 65,000 uh, cubic microns. And based on synaptic counts in that area, each one has in its domain about 120,000 synapses. And they follow the layers of the hippocampus, the perforant path, the commissural associational fibers. There's a band of them that are only in one versus the other domain. So there's a lot of work to do there. So this is the, the method that I like to call the Dinkatome. Winfred uh, Dink, when he worked this out, he refined a technique that Steve Layton had originally described in 1981, puts a microtome inside of a scanning electron microscope, and you shave off. It's more like a carpenter's plane. You're not trying to collect a section. You're just sort of grinding it off very thinly. And then you scan the surface. And it turns a scanning electron microscope into something. This is the microtome that Winfred had the machinists uh, really uh, uh, pushed to design in the Heidelberg machine shop. This is what happens if you look at an astrocyte with this machine. Okay. Now this is an old-fashioned but slightly refined Golgi technique. Right. So it's Golgi EM. And you can see all of these processes of neurons or spiny dendrites. There's an astrocyte in the middle. Now, I can tell you that we can do this genetically, and I'll get to that as well, okay? This happens in this machine magically. You put the specimen in, you have to make the specimen, that's the hard part, and the machine will run, in this case, it was about six days, generate a data set like this. Here's one that's a little more fun, astrocyte, and you see some of the associations with the vessels. And you can see how thin the processes are. Now we're going beyond the best that we could do with the light microscopic techniques eight years ago. And you can begin to see these tiny little processes, which I, don't, I won't show you the data, but they move around, actually. In aging animals, they pull away from synapses. So these are pretty dynamic. Sorry? Well, the dimension across the field that I showed you is about 100 microns. So this is not Golgi. This is using the same machine, the Denkatome, with some improvement to the staining that we developed to enhance the, uh, let's say, functionality of the technique. We made the blocks electrically conductive so that we wouldn't get charging. So this looks just like traditional thin sectioning, except that we're motoring through this block. This is probably, uh, again, about six days of imaging. You can see we're, we're moving along through this capillary. This is not, and, and we've stained, you can see the mitochondria, you can see the endoplasmic reticulum. I'll show you later, we get quite a bit of detail. We can follow synapses, synaptic vesicles, postsynaptic densities, all the famous parts. I'll just move. Because that data set that you saw would take 28 years to segment, we've been developing, like so many others, automatic segmentation techniques. So this is a hybrid method which goes through, picks the mitochondria, picks the synaptic vesicles, separate algorithms, pick the surfaces. And then you'll see we'll pick out one, this is cerebellum, by the way, pick out one process, the mitochondria, the vesicles. Okay. So again, these are semi-automated methods, things that will allow this kind of very, very large data, terabytes of data every day, that we're obtaining to be segmented and put into atlases. Now back to the astrocyte. This is Eric Bouchong's working on this now. I grabbed this just as I left. We want to look at the astrocyte at this level of detail. We're trying to understand uh, from the old Watergate uh, term, follow the money. We want to look at the energy uh, systems. So from the vessels to the mitochondria, et cetera, get uh, quantitative information about how much capacity an astrocyte contributes to a region of brain, and then how they associate with dendritic spines, and what are the rules? If you have an astrocyte 
that uh, abuts another one, and it's it follows a dendrite, let's say a, 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 a spiny dendrite, what happens to the spines that could be touched by the two adjacent astrocytes? Is there a one spine, one astrocyte rule? Okay. So moving along, deeper, we want to go intracellularly. So this is popular now. You can see uh, an article in Science 2009 just to tell you what was in the, the special issue. Uh, it's become popular now, even in uh, uh, prokaryotic cells, to think of cells as highly organized, little crystals. You'll notice the nucleus is sort of, uh, I think this is a NATO symbol or something close. It's because we don't understand it and nobody can agree. But patterning inside the cell is of great interest. So I'd like to push the question to another level. Can we make a brain of visible cells? If uh, Edeline and my discussions are close to accurate, maybe they're in the brain, uh, 2,500 order different cell types that you'll get to by at least the in situ hybridization level. How many of those can we pick and do an example down to a level where you could see the molecules or macromolecules? What sort of resolution do you need if, to build a brain of visible cells with at least a couple of examples of every cell type? Well, microtubules are 24 nanometers in diameter. So for Nyquist sampling, you'd want a resolution of about 10 nanometers. That's actually not too hard, even with that serial block face imaging. But really, to see macromolecules and understand them by shape, or if you can paint them, you want to be at a resolution that allows you to see about a 10 nanometer uh, protein. So I think we need to be at about 3 nanometers. This is just pushing it to give you the size of the number. If you did a whole mouse brain, it would be a zetavoxel. Okay. Now you saw the Moore's Law curve. That's no longer exciting. The curve that's interesting is the curve for the falling of the price of storage costs. Or more interesting, the bandwidth between places. So if data are distributed and everybody contributes a little piece of data and you can link it together, you actually can at low cost create enough sort of public storage to store data of this sort. This is why we get into this federation notion of how you make an atlasing system that allows you to casually go to data that's distributed in multiple places. You just need frameworks to link it. If you want to get to the point where you deal with numbers like this, you're not going to do it in any single location anytime soon. Okay. So how do we get down to that level? So we move from the Dinkatome approach to a technology I mentioned earlier, electron tomography. This is extreme tomography. Here's a person for size reference. She's loading a sample. This is the world's largest electron microscope. It's at Osaka University. I've worked with this group for a very long time. We introduced electron tomography to this instrument, helped them build the cameras. We run this microscope from San Diego. We send the samples. This is a five micron thick sample. Okay. So this microscope, because the electrons are so energetic, I can get extremely high resolution in a sample thickness that you'd normally look at by uh, light microscopy. But of course, this isn't practical. I can't get enough time on this one-of-a-kind instrument in Japan. So we've gone to designing and developing instruments with manufacturers that let us do this in a, in a medical school facility, in a regular university lab. So this is an instrument, about $7 million, from uh, what used to be Philips, FEI. And this is a new technology called high angle dark field. And you see, again, a selectively stained neuron. This particular staining is giving us synaptic vesicles as well and other things. So here's the cup of the postsynaptic structure. You can see the shadows of the synaptic vesicles. Now that's two microns thick at 300 kV. This microscope, because it's in its own sort of babushka environment, will run like a robot for three weeks, kind of like the Dinkatome will. So with proper programming, I can make these microscopes do quite a bit. This is uh, our laboratory. I think that uh, Alan has been there. He knows it's kind of like uh, uh, a chop shop for microscopes. We say, we pimp your microscope would be the. So this is an old microscope I salvaged 
It's a 25-year-old microscope, and we put a $5 million worth of parts camera under it, much more extensive than anything on the Hubble. So this is 8K by 8K with 30% uh, contrast at Nyquist for any engineers. So we acquire with this instrument in an automated way tomograms, one right after another, of sections that are a quarter to one micron thick. And this is one example of a complete cell reconstructed with this 8K device. And you can see this is a saccular hair cell. And here, manually, there's been quite a bit of tedious delineation of structures. You can see how great this is if you go intracellularly and you begin to map these kinds of things. I won't go through all these movies or I'll be here for longer than I'm allowed. Probably will be anyway. So in order to mark proteins, we need to get to where we can go beyond just recognizing proteins based on their structure. Here we can recognize actin. So we developed a technology starting again some time ago for using the generation of singlet oxygen here with eosin to paint molecules and deposit diaminobenzidine. We tested this with the acetylcholine receptor with bungrotoxin and eosin as the singlet oxygen generator. Never published this. This is just a proof of principle for us. So this is purified acetylcholine receptor from torpedo. You can see the pore down the middle. Here it is in a tissue now. This is at a neuromuscular junction. So this proves that this technique will get us, you know, the ability to recognize and stain things at that level. So we initially, because uh, GFP won't generate singlet oxygen, Roger Chen's group developed, and then we perfected how to do this with a small domain that we cloned in that contained four cysteines and then ligands that bind to that. And this system, the so-called uh, tetracysteine system, allows you to do dynamic imaging based on this ligand that's associated in the light microscope. And then chemical fix, expose it to stronger light in the presence of oxygen and diaminobenzidine, and you paint the molecule. Okay? And so here you see live gap junctions in this case in the EM and the structure that you see afterwards. Well, this was a great system. We did a lot of fun things with it over the last six to nine years. We got it to the point, again unpublished, where we can see single protein complexes in synthesis in the endoplasmic reticulum, but still we weren't satisfied because these were hero experiments. So one of the postdocs in Roger's lab, Chai Kun Shu, started working on a more powerful singlet oxygen generator. Again, we haven't published this. We're still waiting for the reports. This is called the mini singlet oxygen generator. It comes from Arabidopsis. It's a, a singlet oxygen quantum yield is 0.47, so about two photons, one singlet oxygen. And you can see here, this is probably histone 2b, what we get to. Here it's driven to mitochondria with a mitochondrial targeting sequence. And here's the mitochondria that's been photoconverted after watching it in live cells. Here's another example, again, my favorite cell, the astrocyte. We're expressing this. This is now in mice after in utero electroporation. So this works in mice, it'll work in transgenics if you have a budget to make them. And here's a, again, a slightly more interesting project to me, now looking at a neurodegenerative disease, or at least proteins associated with it. This is uh, alpha-synuclein, looking at alpha-synuclein in long-term cultures, first in nerve terminals, then moving back to the cell body through multivesicular bodies, and then accumulating in the Golgi uh, lysosomal complex. So we can begin to chart the systems that in this disease are susceptible. There are several disease genes in that system. Here's another system that I think we should apply this technique to, and that's, as I said earlier, mapping the nucleus. So here what we've done is we've made a histone 2B singlet oxygen generator, mini-SOG, and we've painted chromatin. And these are at about the same. This is a, a model by uh, Janet Iwasa. But you can see that we can get down to the level and follow it now in 3D with the techniques that I showed you a few minutes ago, chromatin structure. So there's one cell system that I think would be good. And talking with Sydney earlier, I think I have another idea. This is the Purkinje cell. If we want to understand the organization of the nucleus relative to the organization of cytoplasm, it's useful to have a cell where the dendritic arbor gives you a clocking of the or, or, orientation of the nucleus. 
here's what I mean. So of course the Purkinje cell has this fan-shaped dendrite. We keep track of the orientation of the fan, then not only do we know where the dendritic and the axonal arbors are because they're almost opposite poles, but we can clock the rotation and we can map nuclei with this technique. Not only the overall structure of the nucleus, but we can go in with specific new probes and look at specific genes. Okay. So this is, in the few minutes that I have, meant to summarize the whole brain catalog, so I'm going to jump back. I've not had a chance to show this movie in such a nice theater. With such nice acoustics. I paid quite a bit for the orchestra here. So no mice died in this. Can we get the lights down just a little bit? There we go. So Yuri, this is for you. This is looking at the dentate gyrus now. We picked some neurons to be represented this. Which we knew to be uh, the type that arose in adult animals. And this is from work with Nico Tony and Rusty Gage. We characterize these ganglion, uh, these granule cells as they appear in the hippocampus. And so the cell that you'll see us come to in a moment it's not an animator's fantasy, it's taken from the real anatomy. I use this movie to show not only the tyranny of spatial scales, but the tyranny of temporal scales that we deal with in our challenge to fill gaps. So how do we, how do we represent that? How do you have the equivalent of an oscilloscope with uh, two time bases? So we chose with the orchestra that we hired to help us to do that by the composition, by the music. So you go from the kind of noise that you heard of the electrical activity to something slightly more delicate. As you ask, well, how are synapses made? And what's the time scale over which they occur? So here you see the fine phylopodial processes. The dendrites tend to send out looking to hook up for a good time. They're looking for that hot axon in the street, okay? And they're really not allowed to do that until my friend the astrocyte appears on the scene. Astrocyte, enter stage left, there you go. And the astrocyte is spritzing stuff in the vicinity, as Ben Barras and Eric William have shown, thrombospondins and other molecules. Then they kiss and start to do interesting things, deposit receptors, and the otherwise cacophonous interaction becomes melodic. Is that how it happens, Yuri? And this is all deep in the brain and over and over again. And uh, just making the movie is fun, but the real software, this is supposed to say funding to be continued. We're looking for funding. <laughs> it's on YouTube, yeah, yeah. And I, I again have to thank Ted Waite and his generosity for helping with that. The actual site, uh, I'll just take one more second here. Is, a, is actually a lot of fun. You can go there. We'll have another re release of the software uh, at the neuroscience meeting. Again, it, it takes advantage of all of the infrastructure that the uh, Allen organization has put together. Uh, this is an interactive environment and it's multi-scale, so we use an open source video game engine. One of the things that we wanted to do was allow the insertion of models of simulations that had been done on these sorts of things. So you go in and you play a simulation. So these are the growing neurons from the gauge lab from Brad Imony's thesis, now placed appropriately in the hippocampus, getting imprinted on their pattern of activity and taking up their position. The other thing that you're able to do with this site is uh, you can bring in a cursor in 3D. I think that's going to happen here in a second. Uh, 
I'm a little faster than my movie today. So this is the 2.5D environment. I want to make this work in a 3D environment, really 3D uh, soon. But you right click on this and you can ask uh, uh, from the ABA, you see, spatial query ABA, give me all the genes in the place I just put that. And then you bring up another uh, page from the Allen site and let you, so this is one of many sites that we've linked in. So this is, how would you say, an interactive window. Not only can you do this, but you're meant to be able to bring your data in, kind of like the street view model that I started with. And you can go to the protein data bank and paint and decorate with channels, et cetera, et cetera. So I think with that, I'll just acknowledge that uh, I raise money and I'm a spokesperson and everybody else does the work and that uh, because of the characteristics of this theater I needed to say that we're really into the future. Thank you. <laughs>